My name is Gal Wiseman, and the name of the talk that I'm going to give today called JavaScript Realms, the Blank Spot in Web Application Security. Um, I'd like to lay out the talk for you real quick. So I'm going to start off by talking about the evolution of the web, how we transition from websites to web apps, um, the way I see it. Um, we're going to dive deeper into the importance of security and visibility in that context. And later on, we're going to talk about how third-party solutions came into play and helped us solve problems relating to security and visibility, how exactly they do it, and what I think they all miss. And we're going to talk about JavaScript realms, which are the blank spot that I think that most of those uh, third-party solutions miss. And eventually, we're going to talk about Snow.js, which is a really cool project that we're working on that's supposed to help solve that problem. Um, but let me first uh, introduce myself. So my name is Gal Wiseman. I have been doing web and browser JavaScript security for almost a decade now, I think. Um, I started off at the 8200 unit of the IDF. And that's where I first got introduced to JavaScript security. Um, I work for several startups as well. Um, I think the most famous one of them is Perimeter X, which are also doing um, web and browser JavaScript related stuff. And I also have a lot of published work um, in the field of publishing web application CVEs, um, some cybersecurity advanced techniques and stuff like that. And today I work for MetaMask, which is a crypto wallet company. Um, and I am one of the people that's responsible for the security of the, the extension in the browser. Um, so that's about me. And I think we're good to go. So the way I see it at the beginning, we had um, simple websites, and so they were simple and they were static, and therefore they were secure and they were the visibility into them was was quite clear um, for a number of reasons. So first of all, there was a minor exposure to code, so the development and the deployment were very straightforward, and therefore the code was not really uh, being processed through a lot of different tools back then, not as today. Um, the frequency of changes was also pretty low, so harming the visibility into the application and its security uh, was harder when the frequency of changes was low. Um, and I think most importantly is how back then the dependency on third-party code was very minor. And therefore, um, so back then we didn't really have supply chains and third-party services were not that big of a thing yet. Um, so in terms of security and visibility, that was also um, a bit more simple. Um, and then we progressed, and we started having what we know today as web applications, which are complex and more dynamic. And I say that in a good way, um, because now we have automated development, build, and deployment processes, which allow us to um, develop more quickly. Um, we depend more on outsourced code instead of writing our own code, which is always a good thing because we, we can trust other people to do their job um, instead of trying to do it ourselves, which is, which is good. Um, and also we consume in our web application a lot of third-party services that enhance what our app has to offer. So a good example to that is usually, for example, um, advertisement and payment um, services, which we usually include in the application, and that really allows us to to enhance what the application has to offer. Um, but it also brought complexity to the security and visibility aspect um, because the exposure to code got to a place where um, the development, the build and deployment are being processed by, by just so, mu so much code um, and we're less sure what the output is going to be. Um, the frequency of changes being a complex web application is higher. So you have rapid development cycles, you have um, continuous improvement. You're trying to make sure that the users, that they have expectations, you want to make sure that they get what they want. And the complexity of the application in general is just like 
higher. Um, and I think most importantly is how the dependency on third party code became major. And we transitioned to a place where, uh, we have a massive supply chain that we are building our application on top and we're relying on third party services, uh, which means that a lot of the code that runs within our web application is unknown to us. Um, so maybe this is a good time to try to understand the importance of security and visibility in this context. Um, so visibility refers to the ability to see into the inner workings of a system and understand what is happening within it, um, which is important, especially today, because since the application is just so complex, you want to make sure that if errors are being thrown or any loggings, you, you can capture them. You want to make sure that the level of performance is as good as you want it to be. Uh, you want to make sure that the user experience is as good as it used to be. Um, and I think most importantly, you want to make sure that the security level is the same, even though you rapidly change your application. So, as I said, security is important and it's hard to maintain the same security level when you don't, when you lack visibility and your app constantly changes. Um, and also based on the fact that we're building our projects on top of code that we're unaware of. Um, I think this is a, this is an important point to point out here <coughs> because back then we had applications that most of the vulnerabilities they, they, uh, offered were from outside the application. And since we now have third party services and supply chains, we ended up in a place where the attacker is inside the app, um, and not coming from outside of it. Um, and that brings us to what we have today. So web applications are still complex and they're still dynamic, but now the security and the visibility into the application has improved thanks to third party services. Um, so here are just like a few examples on the security side and on the visibility side, you have a number of companies that allows you to install JavaScript, um, libraries within your application with server-side um, oriented solutions that allow you to understand better the, the visibility of the application and also its security. Um, so third-party services are great and you have many different approaches, but we're going to focus on the client-side oriented solution today, which are these products, some of them. So it's important to understand how those solution help us gain security and visibility. Um, so by granting the solution control over our application in runtime, they have the ability to allow to assist us in that mission. So, for example, in terms of uh, of security, you can use that power to monitor sensitive operations being made in the app and maybe detect uh, detect strange behavior. You can also use that power to block. Um, the app from communicating with malicious entities or accessing sen sensitive information. Um, and in terms of visibility, it helps us a lot with mapping out what happens in the app, um, capturing errors and logs, tracking the user experience level, and monitor for performance changes. So that's all examples for stuff that third-party services allow us to solve. Um, now, let's just make sure that we understand how those work. So, first you include them in the app, commonly as a third-party script. You make sure it's usually included as, uh, as in the beginning of the, of the application for it to cover um, the most parts of it. And then what those usually do, they use uh, what we call behavioral overriding, which is also known as monkey patching. Um, so, this is a really simple example just to get the hang of what uh what monkey patching is so here for example i want to monkey patch the alert function to function a little bit different than it used to so i want to make sure that anyone can use the alert function as usual but maybe i want to filter out and throw errors for certain strings that i would i disapprove alerting um, so here specifically i override the alert message and i make sure that if anyone passes the alert message, a message that, that includes the word uh, Voldemort, then I 
throw an error. Um, and that is just like an example of what is behavioral overriding. Um, and this allows services to get full visibility and control into the app at runtime. So this is basically how the third party scripts um, work in, in terms of like solving security and, uh, and visibility. Um, so let's dive into actual examples of security and visibility. Um, so in terms of visibility, what you have products that, for example, um, hook and report any errors messages um, that are being thrown or printed into the, into the console. Um, a real example to that would be LogRocket, and this is another example for that. So you can see here that I override the real console log, um, and I make sure to always continue to log the messages that I receive, but I also make sure to report the message to the log-server.com um, server. Um, so that, that is like a actual example of how LogRocket works, for example. Um, and in terms of security, you have, uh, for example, you have solutions that are just, for example, trying to defend the local storage from being accessed um, to sensitive information. Um, a real example to that would be Perimeter X, um, which is a company that I used to work for and we used to work on stuff like that. Um, so you can see here in this example for um, here, sorry, that um, what we're doing here is that we're monkey patching the get item property descriptor of the storage object. And we make sure that if anyone tries to access the secret item, we make sure to not return it. Um, and that is just like a very simplified example to how we can use monkey patches to defend sensitive information within the local storage. Um, obviously, this can get more complex and, and better secured, but that's just like the gist of it. Um, try to remember this example because we're going to get back to it. Now, now that we understand how third-party solutions work, I'd like to explain the problem the way I see it. Um, so, in my opinion, most of the solutions are missing something important, um, which affects security mostly. Um, and they are lacking visibility into JavaScript realms. So before I jump into the problem, I want to make sure that we understand realms in JavaScript. So understanding realms is not as simple as I thought. Um, and therefore, I made sure to do some research. And I also published um, a blog post trying to explain realms um, to the best of my uh, ability, but let me sum, sum it up for you. So you can informally think of a realm as basically an ecosystem in which a JavaScript program lives. And just like any other ecosystem, it includes different elements that JavaScript programs must have in order to exist within. Um, so some of these elements are the, for example, each realm has its own global execution environment, which means that if you have two different realms, they have separate um, execution environments, and those ex execution environments provide with a global object, which usually grants access to um, intrinsic objects um, and APIs, which is the good old um, array, object, function, things that are native to JavaScript. Um, and the global object usually exposes um, platform-based objects based on the platform. So in the browser, for example, you'd have the document, you have a fetch API, and stuff like that. Um, and a realm is a JavaScript concept, but its implementation in the browser introduces more aspects to be aware of. Um, so let's just make sure we understand that as well. So the browser API to a realm's object called window, and by default, a web app lives within one si single realm, which is the top main realm, and that is also accessible via the top property. Um, and you can have child realms, and those child realms will be same region to the top main realm by default. Um, and same region means that two realms are from the same region, and they can therefore dynamically access and manipulate each other synchronously to almost every extent. Um, you can achieve same region realms using iframes, frames, you can also use the object and embed elements, you can use the 
open API that allows you to get a new tab. And that tab we, would be by default same region to the top main realm as well. Um, but a realm can also be cross a region to, to another realm. Um, and that will no longer allow the two realms to communicate synchronously. And that is due to security. Um, so good examples for cross region realms are web workers and service workers. They also have their own realms and those realms are going to be cross region to the top main realm as well. And this is just like a very simple example of how uh, the top main realm with a child realm looks like in the HTML aspect. So let's combine everything that we learned so far. So why do I see realms as the blank spot of runtime security? Um, so there are two main reasons we're going to focus on today. So the first one is how realms can go under the radar of third-party services behavioral overrides, which means if I applied my security mechanism or my visibility mechanism into the top main realm, that doesn't apply by default to the child realms. And that means that I can execute code within a child realm that will go under the radar of the, of the uh, mechanism applied to the top main realm. Um, and the other problem is that realms can not only execute separately within their own environment, they can also modify uh, and manipulate the environment of the top main realm and still go under the radar of those security mechanisms. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into those two examples with, with actual code examples. So the first one is um, the going under the radar argument. Um, so if you remember the example from before, this is the same picture from before. We're overriding the get item property of the storage object, and we make sure that no one has access to the secret item um, property. And you can see that when, I'm, when we're trying to access it, we get null, even though its real value is A. But if we create a new realm, attach it to the DOM, and then access the local storage of that realm, and then try to access the secret item, we're going to be able to access it. And that means that our security mechanism did not, did not apply. In terms of visibility, sorry, um, the, the other argument is the fact that we can use child realms to manipulate the upper realm. Um, so here I have a different example. Um, in this example, I am trying to consume within my web application a third-party service that allows me to, um, to digest uh, payment. So I am trying to create an iframe that implements the trustedpaymentservice.com. Um, and as a security mechanism, I want to make sure that no one has the ability to redirect to anything else than the trustedpaymentservice.com. Um, so I can achieve that by overriding the behavior of the source property of the iframe prototype and make sure that if anyone try to do it differently, I'm just going to throw an error. Um, and you can see here that when I create an iframe and I try to redirect it to the fake payment service.com, I get an error and the SRC remains as before. But the problem here is that I can just create a new realm, extract the iframes prototype SRC getter from within that realm and use it to apply to the top main realm's iframe and then try to change its SRC. And you're going to see that it's, it's not going to go through the error because it's not the same prototype and therefore we're going to get, we're going to be able to change the SRC of the, of the iframe. So, that's just me trying to lay out the two problems in actual code examples. Um, this effectively leaves realms out of reach of security mechanisms and disability mechanisms. Um, and the way I see it, it makes the, um, it makes it really hard to protect and monitor uh, the rest of the application. Um, Yeah, and you can easily 
leverage that ability to bypass those uh, mechanisms. So hopefully I managed to lay out the problem um, in order for us to understand the, the needed solution. Um, the way I see it, the needed solution is a way to take dynamic logic and automatically apply it to all child realms um, and not only to the top main realm. So let me dive a little bit deeper into that proposal. Um, we need an easy way, sorry, um, so we need, we need to make sure that we can achieve that and we want to make sure that we're covering same region realms only because covering cross region realms is A, impossible. You cannot synchronously access cross region realms as a security mechanism and also it is irrelevant because it means that a third party iframe is not posing any security concern to your application in the terms that we're talking about in this talk. Um, and in my opinion, it kind of makes sense to have the ability to control your own realms within your own application, similar to the power that extensions already have. So an extension can, at any point, ask the browser to execute code within every new realm that comes to life within the application. So you might want to have the same power um, granted to the application itself, but strictly for same region realms of the application. Um, we want to end up giving the application the ability to control its own realms. To me, it's only logical. Um, would have made a hell of a browser native API, in my opinion. We're going to get to that as well. Um, but in the meantime, we don't have that as a browser native API. And to implement that as a JavaScript shim is a very hard task to accomplish, mostly for two main reasons. Um, so first of all, you have to cover every possible way of creating a same region realm. Um, and that is difficult, especially because you're uh, dealing with DOM related stuff. And therefore, there's just like so many ways to do so many things. Um, so you have to make sure you cover all of them. Otherwise, there's just, it takes one way to bypass your solution to make it uh, irrelevant, basically. And I think the other problem is that you not only have to cover every possible way, you need to make sure that you cover it synchronously. Because if some, if I manage to get visibility into a new realm, but after the the entity that actually created it, it means that the entity might abuse it before I have the chance to defend it. So that's a hard thing to accomplish. And this is where I want to introduce um, Snow.js. Um, so Snow is exactly that. It's a JavaScript shim. Um, it stands for securing nested ownership of Windows, Windows being the reference of realms in the browser ecosystem. Um, it has the simplest API, it just receives a callback. We're going to see it in the next slide. Um, it does everything synchronously. It covers a big amount of ways to form same region realms. Ideally, we'd like to cover all of them. That is a work in progress. And I've learned in a hard way that this is a very complicated task to accomplish. Um, Snow smoothly supports uh, all browsers, Safari, Firefox, every Chromium browser. Um, it smoothly supports most of the major web applications that we know of. Um, and it is heavily tested, especially for security reasons, to make sure that the different ways to create same region realms um, cannot be used to bypass Snow. And using it is supposed to be really simple. You can either consume it as a package or you can uh, implement it as a third party script. And once you do, a new property called snow will be accessible via the global object. Um, and that property receives a callback and that callback will be passed on the reference to the new realm created every time that it does. Um, so this is like the simplest example of how you can use Snow. This will log every new instance of every new realm in the page um, easily. Um, so how does Snow work? Snow is a complicated uh, project. Um, and Snow also leverages the monkey patches um, technique because, as I said before, we have to synchronously capture every attempt to form a new realm. 
Um, and if we don't do it synchronously, we're going to lose the battle. Um, and therefore, we have to use the monkey patches um, technique to create a perfect gym. Um, so you have a lot of different ways to insert uh, new realms. You can, you can use the um, actual nodes insertion to DOM. You can use insertion of HTML to DOM. Uh, you can achieve new realms by creating um, new tabs. Uh, you can redirect already attached DOM elements um, to different SRCs back to same region. You have like a lot of different techniques. Uh, you got to uh, cover nested realms as well. Um, and one of the interesting parts is that you have to make sure that your project is using secure JavaScript. Um, this is the cat and mouse game around monkey patches because if Snow's logic uses um, a certain native API that someone else monkey patch in the application, then that entity might interfere Snow um, remaining secured. So you have to make sure that the APIs that you use within your shim are also unforgeable. Um, so that is also an important security aspect of the project. Um, I'll soon show you the demo and hopefully it'll make more sense. Um, but I want to talk about how Snow uh, serves us. So I'm going to attach this back to the examples that we have before of the two main problems of of, um, of same origin realms. So the first problems that we talk about is how realms can go under the radar of third-party services mechanisms. Um, so this is the same picture as before. You can see that we have at the end of it the bypass um, for the security mechanism where we create a realm and we access the secret item. Um, but here you can see that we're using Snow so instead of just running this logic, we make sure to pass that logic into Snow as a callback. And we make sure that every time we execute this logic, we do so for the window, um, for the specific window object that we receive. With Snow, this allows us to effectively execute this logic, the security mechanism for every new realm that comes to life and therefore enhance the security mechanism on to the um, to to the new realm. And you can see at the bottom that we're running the exact same operation, but this time we're once again getting null because the security mechanism now <coughs> not only applies to the top main realm, it also automatically applies to all child realms. Um, and this goes for the second example as well of how realms can affect the top main realm. So once again, we have the same example as before. And you can see here that we successfully changed the iframe source to the fake payment service.com, which is the malicious website. Um, but here you can see that if we do this, we achieve the same thing using snow, then trying to change that SRC with a prototype that we, sorry, that we pulled outside of the, of the realm, it's not going to work for you anymore. And I think it's important to note why, why this is an actual security problem. Um, it's mostly because of what I said before of how the attacker is inside. Um, the fact that your application I, um, potentially can execute code that you do not um, control due to supply chain security problems might result in malicious code trying to do stuff like that exactly. And with Snow, you can make sure that any security mechanism that you consume and apply to your application would, by default, apply to all same origin child games, which is, the way I see it, ver is very important. So the current state of Snow is that Snow is actively being used um, by MetaMask. Um, so we integrated Snow into um, LavaMote, which is a project that we're working on that also applies a security mechanism to the extension. Um, I'll just shortly explain LavaMote. So LavaMote is a simple tool that allows you to sandbox every package that you use in your supply chain attack and your supply chain. Um, and once the isolation applies, then part of the LavaMote um, security mechanism is to make sure that the top main realm is 
unusable and mostly inaccessible. We do so by just simply overriding all the properties of the top main realm, so no malicious entity could use it. Um, but the problem is that this logic does not apply automatically to all realms. So an attacker can just create a new realm and then just pull any um, any disabled logic from that realm. Um, and that is because it's so far was impossible to grant that power onto realms. But with Snow, that is exactly what we can accomplish. And this mechanism is successfully protecting um, MetaMask 30 million users, give or take. Um, and that allows us to defend same origin realms, which is pretty cool. Um, so the future of Snow, the way I see it, um, improving security is going to be one hell of a ride. Um, because of how there's just so many ways of creating same region realms. And I just hope this is a battle that um, Snow would be able to win. Um, I would love to improve Snow's adoption in terms of contribution, in terms of um, consumption um, for security and for feasibility. And we're also trying to initiate talks about making it a default API in the browser. That would be great because um, that would mean that applying it automatically to same region realms would be more native um, rather than trying to monkey patch it through my uh, JavaScript shame here. Um, and that's pretty much it. I can quickly show you a demo of how Snow actually works if I had Wi-Fi. So I'm going to take care of that. So this is a live demo. Um, you can access it at any time um, going here. And in this demo, I simply use Snow to disable the alert function. So the whole point here is to basically play a game and try to pop an alert on the top main realm. Um, and that is not a simple thing to do thanks to Snow. So you can see that the alert message is monkey patch to um, log a message instead. And here I also have an example of the different things that you can try to do to bypass snow that are not going to work. Um, so you can see here that I attach a, an iframe to the page and I try to use the alert message, but instead I get a log message. Um, you can see that I try to do to accomplish the same thing with um, with HTML, and I'm going to get the same thing. Um, trying to use event listeners, trying to use um, global event handlers, um, and that doesn't work. These are simple examples, to be honest, and this is an example, like quite an old old example. Um, but we have very advanced techniques to make sure that same region realms cannot bypass Node these days. Um, so I encourage you to try to go on this app and like prove that you can pop an alert. That would be amazing. That would be a by like a complete bypass of snow, and that would be really helpful for the project as well. Um, and that's pretty much it. So thank you. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. All right. Thanks a lot. Oh, yeah. Just wondering about the example of getting the opponent that one of those tools to do that inside the snow part of the cloud. Do what? Like these? The snow stop those kind of things. Oh, no. You can, you can basically take their logic. You would probably have to apply some modifications to, the, to their actual logic these days, but not, not a major one, in my opinion. But you can generally just like bypass their logic into Snow, and Snow would make sure to just apply that logic to all realms. Um, I also tried to convince Sentry um, to use Snow, and we're having conversation at the moment. And I managed to show them in a very simple demo of how you can just like 
integrate Sentry simply into Snow and make sure that Sentry tracks the top main realm and all child realms automatically uh, as well. Thanks a lot.